All right. Thank you, Galit. Thanks a lot. So working group two is uh, colloquially known as uh, learning in networks. And indeed, today's uh, talk will be uh, about uh, learning theory applied, uh, applied to a network context. I would have to say that uh, usually we are a very uh, pessimistic uh, group, uh, always dealing with worst case results, uh, things like regret, uh, missed opportunities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, today's speaker is going to be much more optimistic because he will be speaking about the effects of cooperation uh, in a network environment when uh, several different agents uh, are uh, learning and communicating between them. And uh, today's speaker will be uh, Tom Tommaso Cesare, uh, who did his uh, studies in mathematics uh, at, uh, at Milan and also his PhD there, and he just finished, uh, and is now a postdoc in uh, TSE in uh, Toulouse uh, Schools of Economics uh, and uh, has a joint affiliation between TSE and uh, the um, Toulouse Artificial Intelligence Institute. So, uh, I am very happy and uh, honored to have uh, Tom as a speaker, to, uh, to introduce um, Tom as a speaker to, uh, today. So Tom, the floor is all yours. Well, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. And of course, thank you for the invite. Thank you, Lara, also for, uh, for the great uh, talk before me. Well, let me start my chronometer because I was more gauging towards the 25 minutes. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna get to too much time. And it's true, I will talk about cooperation, but it will be kind of in the same pessimistic worst case lane that, uh, that you were mentioning before. So um, at a high level, the things that we will discuss today is uh, indeed when you have a network of, of agents, all of which are trying to learn the, a, common, uh, a common problem. So you're solving a common online complex optimization problem. And uh, you can see this happening in a large scale learning system where usually you have a distributed system and uh, the communication among agents might be uh, limited due to constraint because of bandwidth or because uh, of, um, of a limited range. If you imagine these as sensors, actually the first, uh, the, the initial motivation for, for studying these sort of problems came from uh, um, from climate science. So imagine like this, uh, this picture that I have, so let's make use even of the title picture. It represents a some, somehow homogeneous region on the earth. And you're trying to predict uh, some behavioral patterns in, uh, in the atmospheric uh, uh, dynamics. So say that uh, uh, each of, so an agent at some point like this one gets uh, triggered because of some pollutants or something. Uh, gets above a certain threshold. And so when this happens, the agent is, uh, is asked to make a prediction, say on how the temperature is going to raise in the next 24 hours. Then after all this happens, when the day, uh, when the day is over, the, uh, the agent will get some feedback on this observation. And the idea is that the feedback, of course, can be used by the agent itself to, uh, uh, to uh, maintain his local modem local model, but it might also be shared with the neighbors that were not activated, but still were, are in range at the time that this, uh, this event happened. And the, the idea of this talk is going to be to give you some overview of uh, some of these variants of this problem and some of the results that are out there, um, mostly by me and the person I work with. So this is a joint work with Nicola, Nicola Cesabianchi, who was my former PhD supervisor, and Claire Monteleoni and Riccardo Della Vecchia also. So let's kick things off with a quote that I blatantly stole from Nicolau's old paper, which is, uh, only a fool learns from his own mistakes. The wise man learns from the mistakes of others. This is kind of the late motif of, the, of this whole setting, how we can improve the overall learning of the system by exploiting learning of, uh, of others. So, okay, let's give a brief, I will try to give it as uh, high level as possible. And just to give you the, the high level ideas that I think that's, in this case, are more important than just give you the, all the details. So consider a network of agents, which in math terms is just uh, an undirected simple graph over a set of say n, uh, n uh, integers. And at each time step, the environment picks uh, a loss a loss function, say some convex differentiable function defined on a subset of Rd. 
and a set of active agents. So the important thing here is that the active agents are not decided by us, by the learning system, it's decided by the environment, like in the example that I gave you earlier. And I will clarify later how these activations work. Now, when an agent is activated, as, uh, as in the example, it will, ask to make, uh, it will be asked to make a prediction, then it will suffer the corresponding loss, and then they will receive some sort of a feedback, which we will also uh, talk about again later. So the cooperation part is that after, all, after the round uh, is almost over, agents are allowed to share information with their neighbors. And uh, the, the type of information could be just the feedback that they received, or it could be something a little bit more, maybe some information about their local model that can be shared with, the, with their, uh, the neighbors in the network. And the idea, again, is uh, unexpectedly for uh, <laughs> people from this pessimistic group is to minimize some uh, notional regret, which is defined uh, um, simply as the difference between the cumulative loss of all the active agents and the loss of the best action in, uh, in hindsight. So let me just clarify the things I was a bit vague before about. And as you will see, I will give you a whole bunch of knobs. And depending on how you turn these knobs, you will have different instances of these cooperation uh, problems. And so by the end, you will have your combinatorial amount of problems that you can uh, solve. Your, some of them will, will be solved already, but some others are still very much open. So how, how activations are, are uh, sorry, I, how agents are activated? Could be adversarially, so maybe you want to be um, you want to be competitive between activation chosen by an adversarial environment for each individual sequence, or stochastic. You might assume that there is some underlying stationary distribution, and uh, uh, agents are just uh, IAD draws. I mean, the activation of just IAD draws from, from the distribution could be just one agent that is active at each time step. Could be more, and uh, you you can have uh, all sorts of feedback. You can have full feedback where you see the whole loss at the end of each time step. You can have banded feedback where you only see the loss of the action that you played. Semi banded, you name it. Now, a, another important thing is the propagation of information. Like when you have no propagation, you're just saying that if you're a node, you make your prediction, you get your feedback. You can share your feedback with your neighbors, and this feedback never leave never leaves uh, your neighborhood. When you have propagation, on the other hand you allow people over rounds to propagate this information throughout the network and so possibly reach uh, uh, nodes that are further away, agents that are further away. So just to kick things off, we will start with uh, just a single agent activation, uh, full feedback and uh, no propagation. And then we will uh, see some other com possible configuration. Actually, for the most of the talk, I will focus on single agent activations. And at the very end, I will tell you what changes with multiple. So just a quick sanity check to establish a benchmark on what we could expect from cooperation, which is what happens if you don't cooperate at all. So let's say that the, each of the agents in your network is running their favorite optimal uh, single agent online contact optimization algorithm for a certain number of rounds. And let's say that T is deterministic just to make things simpler. So each, each one of them will, su will suffer a regret, which is uh, the order of square root of the number of times that they played. Since this is a partition of all the time steps, like a simple uh, Jensen inequality tells you that if there's no co cooperation, you at least would expect to get a, a square, square root of bounds that scale with the number of agents. So the whole idea is uh, we want to beat this rate because the number of agents could be very large. We don't like it. We would like something which is more reflective on the connectivity of the graph. So some sort of, of metric that tells you how the graph is connected. And uh, okay, before going forward, let's also discuss briefly what type of algorithms we would like to use. And the basic idea is we want them to be simple. Right? Whenever we have a distribute, distributed setting, we would like things to be as simple as possible in case uh, one for maintenance reason, in case something goes wrong, we have to replace like uh, physical components or whatever. And this is sort of the simplest interface that we could think of at the time, which is just a one uh, single agent uh, algorithm and all the nodes are playing the same one. Let's imagine, for, for example, online mirror descent. Everybody's playing online mirror descent. Not only that, they're using the same initialization and the same learning rates, so you don't have to do any node-specific shenanigans. 
And everybody makes predictions slash updates whenever they get the opportunity to do so. So they get a, some feedback for somebody, they use it. In this sense, the interface is oblivious in the sense that uh, it doesn't matter if the feedback comes from yourself, if it comes from a node that's your neighbor, your second neighbor, you just use everything without caring about the topological structure of the network. So let's see if this very simple interface can be used to get some results. <laughs> and uh, the first, uh, the first uh, result is a hard no. <laughs> if you, if you, if activation adversarials, so even if just one node is active, let, let me recap, we're just assuming that one node is activated at each time step. There's no propagation, people just uh, share their feedback. And uh, if activation are chosen adversarially, you can find a graph for which no matter the algorithm you use, it's a base algorithm for your own uh, uh, oblivious network interface, you will always get a linear regret. So no learning whatsoever can occur. And uh, to give you the, the reason why, I will show you this picture, which is worth uh, a whole proof. I will also lie a little bit, but with cheating a little bit, you will get the right idea though. So imagine that the, the, the graph, your network is a star. So there is a center, this, the center node that is very well connected and everybody else is just connected with the center. So a strategy for me, if I'm in the environment and I want to really be screwing with the, with the learning system is uh, first, Okay, let's make it even simpler. Let's not even do some fancy fancy online complicated optim optimization. Let's do some uh, uh, learning with expert advice, with two experts and with linear losses. So you only have two arms and each arm gets either zero or one loss. So it's as easy as it gets. What I can do as an environment is the following. Before, so I draw one of the, of the two arms at random and the, this would be the good arm. So the arm that's going to be optimal in hindsight. And at each time step, I draw one node uniformly random among all nodes. And if the node is the peripheral, is a peripheral node, then I will show you the correct losses. So I will show that the loss of the good arm is zero and the other one is one. If the activated node is the center, I will just flip them. If I do it this way, what happens is that the center will see everything, no problem. However, the, cent the center will also increase the spread of bad information because uh, the each peripheral node will be activated roughly the same amount of time that the center is activated. So they will see the same amount of good and bad feedback for both arms and they will henceforth be unable to distinguish the two. So with a, a, uh, with a simple argument you can show that, that uh, any algorithm would have a linear regret. Any I mean, single agent algorithm for the peripheral node will have a single uh, a linear regret. And so the regret of the, of the whole network, which is just the sum, is linear also. So this is just to say that adversarial activation are their own, uh, their own beast. Of course, there are workarounds, like as I told you before, for example, if you ignore all communication, you can have some linear regret. You can do something fancier, like you can say, instead of using the actual topology, I partition the graph in clicks. And I only listen to people, I only share feedback with people in my own clique. Like if you do this, you can, you can kind of see that everybody in the clique has the same state in the sense that they make exactly the same feedback. And so you can kind of maybe see that you would scale in this sense with the, with the clique covering number, which is the smallest number of clicks needed to cover the graph. You can do something even fancier if you allow, if you allow, if you allow agents to share the, the local model also. Like in this case, uh, okay, I will tell you first the node and then in the next picture, I will show why this works. Uh, well, I will give you a pictorial proof, proof by picture of why this works. And um, in this case, uh, you can scale with the so-called domination number that you can think of as the smallest number of stars that you need to cover a graph. So let me just give you a picture of the three cases before, just to give you some, some uh, high level intuition of how things work. This is the quote unquote bad graph in this setting. It's a star. We said our workaround is assuming that uh, people actually don't communicate with each other. This means that actually the graph that they're using in their learning is, non, is no longer a graph, but they're ignoring, purposely ignoring a whole bunch of arcs. And what they're using is just a completely disconnected graph. And you get this bound. Uh, what happens with the click covering? Well, kind of the same thing. You purposely ignore some of the arcs between agents. 
and you only communicate uh, among the agents in the same clique. And, and here you can see that in the same clique, you basically act as your own unique agent. So in the end, you will scale with the number of quote unquote independent units, which is uh, exactly the number of clicks, which I mean, in the worst case that you can see can be almost as big as N. So this is not awesome. Something which is much better, but you're using more knowledge, you're sharing more knowledge on one nodes, is uh, if you click, uh, if you cover with stars instead. And of course, the smallest number of stars that you need to cover star is just one, it's just the star itself. And in this case, uh, you can kind of see that if everybody share their local model with everybody else, in particular, the central node will have access to all the local models of everybody else. And, and this is just to give you a high level idea, doesn't matter if you don't get fully the details, but it's in, indirectly as if all the nodes would have access to all the information of everybody else. It's not a directly, it's indirectly, but it's kind of what happens. So pictorially, it's like instead of having just a star, you would have a full click in terms of the amount of information that you have. And so you can scale with this number, which is much lower. So in general, this is just the graph theoretical stuff. The independence number is always smaller than the click over number, which is always smaller than the number of nodes. And as you can see, there is another little guy here, which is the independence number, which I will introduce next. Well, I also move away from uh, adversary activation and talk to you a little bit about stochastic activation. So uh, the independence number of a graph is simply the smallest uh, sorry, uh, the largest cardinality of, uh, of an independent set. So the, the largest cardinality of a set of nodes, no two of which are adjacent. So in this simple example where we, are, where we have only five nodes, you can see that nodes one and two are independent in the sense that they're not adjacent. And if you think about it for five more minutes, you can see that uh, you cannot find three agents that are all independent. So two would be the independence number of this graph. Now with this in mind, you maybe kind of see this lower bound that you cannot do any better that uh, scaling with the, with the independence number of the graph. And the reason is the following. Think about the graph, any graph, doesn't matter. If activations are, are stochastic, you can, you can just take a distribution Q that is supported on an independent set. If you do so, since you're only sharing the feedback and we are only sharing it locally, so it doesn't, it never leaves, leaves the neighborhood, say that at some point node one is activated. It gets some feedback, feedback, sorry. It shares it with the neighbors. Who cares? We are supported only on one, two for now. So two never get to see any input coming from one. Similarly, similarly the, the, the other way around. So basically this way, we reduce our problem to the problem of alpha, or alpha is independent, independence number, alpha independent learning agents, they're trying to do their best. And we can apply the same reasoning that we applied before to get the, the square root of NT, where this time the independent, uh, the number of independent agents is just alpha. So this is not, uh, this is not random, it's actually the right uh, worst case rate, because uh, you can show, we did it with, uh, with online mirror descent last year, that if, you, if everybody runs online mirror descent with an obvious network interface, you can indeed reach this, uh, this upper bound of square root of alpha t. And I will just give you two nuggets for the proof. I will not give you the, the I, this does not imply the proof at all, it's just two important aspects of the proof. So first of all is uh, the probability of making an update, which is just the probability that a neighbor is active. Since we are in a stochastic environment, now it's independent of time. So this is the big difference. And that, that was the reason when you went ahead and do the computation was the reason why with the adversarial environment, you could get screwed and in this one, you could not. And the other idea, this seems like a kind of random thing to write because I'm not even gonna tell you why this, uh, where this comes from, but uh, it's not, it's not so random. So this is just a simple, again, graph theoretic inequality that tells you that if you have a distribution little Q on the set of nodes of a graph, it's always true that the sum of the probability of the node divided by the probability of the neighborhood the node is at most alpha. So again, this seems kind of random, but uh, the reason why I'm telling you is that if you see these, these papers of, on, uh, on cooperation and you see bounds that, uh, that have alpha in them, 
you can be fairly sure that something will disappear in, in one place or another. And this is quite nice because it's just something that depends on the graph. It doesn't have anything to do with the learning per se. Uh, okay, so now let's move on to, to non-full feedback settings. And let's discuss, let's discuss propagation also at the same time. So in this picture, let's say that a node VT is activated at, at, at a certain point. It gets some, uh, some uh, feedback. And at the end of the round, they share the feedback with possibly some, uh, some local information about uh, their, their state with, uh, with the neighbors. If we allow propagation, what happens is that the following round, this, uh, this knows that now they got some information, they can push the information further. And then again, and in the case of this simple graph in three rounds, information would have reached the whole, uh, the, the whole graph, the whole network. And the reason why, oh, I'm getting a long time. And the reason why I'm telling you, so I will skip some details later. The reason why I'm telling you this is that think about from the perspective of this, of this node, which is not active. Like forget, imagine that you're this node and forget that you're part of the system. Just think about it from your own uh, personal uh, place. From, uh, from your perspective, at some point, a loss has been, uh, has been uh, generated. You don't see it. You don't see the round after, but you do see two rounds after that. So from the perspective of each nodes, it's like the node is playing a single agent online learning uh, problem with delayed, uh, uh, with delays. And this is kind of the idea of the reduction. This is still ongoing work, but they will be published soon. Uh, so I will do my best to cheat and pretend that this is super, <laughs> this is as easy as it is. It's not exactly, but the high level idea kind of is. The high level idea is uh, if you run an algorithm with the Noblis network interface uh, from the perspective of the nodes, this is what's happening. So before giving you the, the result of the reduction, let me just give you a definition, which is the generalization of, uh, of an independence number. This is the something is the diff independence number of a graph. If it's the biggest cardinality of a set of nodes, no two of which has distance d or less, instead of one, it's d or less. It's also called uh, the packing number, a uh, distance d, if you know this uh, from, uh, from somewhere else. And uh, the idea is the following. If you already have an algorithm, single agent algorithm, and you know that this algorithm works well with delays, which is the case for most popular algorithms, or line your descent, for the perturbator, whatever. So you have your, your bound, which is like square root of t. I'm ignoring constants everywhere, by the way. I'm being very sloppy with the, I'm just uh, talking about rates here. Don't be mad for that. So if you have your, uh, your agreement, which case with the, with the t, with the time horizon, plus the sum of the, of the delays, which, what, which is what happens with these uh, optimal algorithms. Then if you run that algorithm, with an oblivious network interface, if you kind of believe, if you have, if you have it within you to believe that uh, this is just what happens from that perspective, you can kind of see that uh, this is going to work well with the system. And uh, quant quantitatively, this rate, square root of t plus the sum of delays, uh, translate into square root of t multiplied by this constant. This constant is the d independence number plus d which is in, within, in this setting is the maximum delay that you're allowing, the maximum propagation that you're allowing. And uh, as you can see, you have this sort of trade-off because the more, uh, the further you allow information to go, so the bigger the D, the smaller the, the alpha D, the less, in, the, it's, it's harder to get to points that are far apart. Uh, so it's, it's hard to find many points that are very distant. They are very distant. Uh, so, when D increases, alpha increases and D decreases. And of course, there is, a, there is an optimal one, which again, it's kind of nice because it only depends on the graph. This is just something that you can uh, compute. Well, computing actually is, is not as easy, but in principle, it's well-defined uh, from, from the graph. And uh, this applies to not only full information as we discussed before, but also bandit, semi-bandit, pretty much everything translates in this reduction. You can do it with a bridge network. Which is, which is quite nice. So very quickly, let me just tell you what happens with the, with the multiple activations. And uh, in terms of results, pretty much everything stayed the same. So with multiple activations, usually you model it by saying that 
each of the agent has their own fixed probability of being activated. And at each round, you just make an IED draw and see who's active and who's not. And uh, same result that you get, pretty much, you get it with, uh, with the multiple activations. The, the proofs are a different story, like proving stuff is not as easy, even though the results stay the same, because now you have all sort of uh, sort of position stuff. I mean, it's, I, I will not get into the details, but just know that uh, there is some, some things to be addressed. And uh, let me just conclude that with some uh, open uh, directions, because as I told at the beginning, there's all sort of knobs that you could uh, that you could explore, and we only saw a subset of them. For example, in the adversary setting, we barely scratched the surface. So we saw that with uh, this oblivious network interface, we couldn't really do much. And we saw some very simple, because the things that I, showed, that I, that I told before, if you think about it, they're really they're not super smart. It's kind of the first thing that you could uh, think of. And uh, what is uh, sort of the minimum amount of additional knowledge that you need in order to make the adversarial setting work? This is still very much open and not, uh, not understood. And uh, when you understand that, of course, uh, the next step is going uh, on to uh, adapted, uh, adapted environments. Because I didn't tell you earlier, but the lower bound that I, that I built earlier, the, the linear lower bound, you didn't even need to be adapted. Right? You can just screw everybody with an oblique adversary, which is quite uh, tricky. Uh, also, one thing that I kind of hid under the carpet is that uh, in the full information setting, you really just need to share the feedback. In the, when you're adding partial information, though, you need to share also some local information about your model. This is really needed to make the theory, the things that I hid, the, th the technical things that I hid work. And uh, while the way that we did it work, it's not clear what's the minimum amount of information that, you, that of additional information that is that you have to share among nodes to make this, uh, this reduction work. Finally, we had this oblivious network interface, which for us was the kind of the simplest type of model, but of course it's just a type of model, which made sense to us. And in principle, you could think of, uh, of many other that would also make sense. So this is pretty much everything I wanted to say. I was uh, five minutes late as, as uh, I was afraid I was be, but I got there. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much as well. And uh, before uh, perhaps going to uh, any questions, if there might be, uh, Galit, just to check how much time do you think we would have? Like three minutes, maybe. Well, you have about five minutes before we're taking 15 minutes break. So five minutes, but a okay. little bit flexible. <laughs> All right. So let's see if you have uh, any questions on uh, on uh, Tom's talk, uh, now is the time to speak. Just unmute yourselves and uh, uh, ask away. Oh. Hi. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. it's yeah. a bit low, but... Uh... Uh, well, I have one question. Uh, if I understood well, you assume uh, the common loss for all agents, is it so? Can you please repeat? I assume? Uh, uh, you assume common loss for all the yes, agents. Yes, yes, exactly. Everybody's solving the same problem. Means that uh, all your local models operate uh, on the same variables. They yes. predict the same uh, variable. Is it so? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. So uh, could you consider, uh, for example, complementary, because each agent can be different and can yes. observe different uh, environment, or partial environment, and they can share different uh, opinions about the same variables. Yes. Enriched by external observation. Have you considered that or not yet? Yes, this is an awesome question. Actually, uh, it's kind of the natural second step because uh, at the very beginning, we, we were really just thinking about everybody solving a common problem. And uh, as you put it, kind of measuring the way in a similar way. But uh, the what you said is kind of the angle where you would have probably not so different uh, losses but different losses nonetheless, that depends on the node. And uh, the idea is, uh, can we in this case, just keep similar, similar theoretical guarantees? And uh, we do have some preliminary results. It's, uh, it's kind of it's very partial results, I have to say, like under additional assumptions, but uh, there is something that works well because all losses are the same. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, uh, Yes, the question is very much worth exploring. Actually, I forgot to write it, so thank you very much for, uh, 
for asking this question. Yes, you can. Uh, actually, we already had uh, we already had some preliminary results, but the extension is not uh, a simple extension. It's kind of uh, their own uh, different problems. So yeah, this is uh, what uh, what I can say about that without spoiling too much. No, actually, that's this is everything I have to say about the, about this. But yeah, thanks for the question. It's a great question. Are there any other questions? I know I talk a lot, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a problem. No, I, I'm actually asking because I also have a question, but I don't want to take anyone at yeah. this time. I have a short question. When you say adaptive environments, yeah. what do you have in mind? So what I mean is right now, uh, the setting, sorry, the environment in, in the adversarial setting that I described, before the game begins, they chose a sequence of losses and the sequence of activations. You can imagine as chosen before the beginning of the game and it's independent of the player's choice. In an adaptive setting, the learner chose, uh, chooses the first loss and activation, then uh, the, the, play, the, the learner reacts, and then uh, the, cho the choice of the second loss and the second activation could be a function of the observed, uh, uh, of the observed actions of the, of the learner. That's what, and it's of course significantly harder, like usually you have lower, you have worse regret bounds, but you can do things sometimes. So it's definitely something uh, interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, well, we are already at uh, <laughs> the half hour mark, so I yeah. will uh, I will keep my passion uh, All right. offline. <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you again, uh, both you. Uh, to you and Laura for uh, your for the great this great beginning. Uh, I don't know if Galit has anything to add, but I would also like to thank her for putting everything together. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Also.